kind of the subject of this discussion, focus in particular on, on climate change, environmental issues. I'll, I want to focus just on how we think a multilateral investment court um, can address the issue of, of climate change. And so those of you that came and heard me um, speak uh, earlier this week, I, 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 cite, I started by citing my son, who is 14, and who um, surprised uh, me a couple of weeks ago by um, going on strike from school and to go um, on, uh, certainly this is very much the case in Europe, on the climate change strike, which children of his age and his generation um, are, are organizing because they are worried that we, uh, our generation, um, and other generations are not um, taking care um, of that uh, concern. Um, and our efforts on the multilateral investment court are a very tiny part um, of the EU's overall efforts um, um, to create uh, effective regulatory environments and to deal um, with, 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 with climate change. Because our efforts on multilateral investment court are intended to, amongst other things, ensure that the right to regulate um, is protected. Now, we, we think that investment rules, investment protection rules, have a role to play in um, encouraging investment. We don't pretend that they are the only thing that matters when um, a company and investors is looking at making investments. Um, but they, they have a role to play. And if you look around the world, you can see lots of examples. We don't call it investment protection, but you see lots of examples where rules are set up in order to protect economic activity. The European Union is a fantastic example of that. When its original um, idea is to set up to protect, uh, for example, German goods, German investors in France through a system of transnational justice. Um, so the idea that rules can encourage investment is something um, which is very common. And we have two, two massive challenges in front of us. One is, is climate change, and the other is ensuring um, um, sustainable development. And neither of these can happen without significant private investment. And so what we have to think, and this is why we think the investment rules are still important, is that we have to make sure that we have in place amongst other things, a system which encourages and which can protect investment. But it cannot come, obviously, at the price um, of uh, undermining states' um, right to regulate. Now, we disagree quite um, um, significantly with what, what Jane has set out, um, that there is an issue with the substantive rules. You can find the substantive rules that we talk about in investment protection everywhere. You can find them in the WTO, you can find them in national constitutions, you can find them in conventions on human rights, um, in many different situations. And they have not prevented states regulating and going very far. The EU takes great pride in leading on climate change, going or preventing climate change, I should be clear, um, takes great um, um, efforts in, in that sense, despite having been subject to many of these rules. And our point is that the current system creates through its ad hoc nature, creates risks that do undermine the right to regulate and impact the right to regulate. Um, and they, they happen through the fact that because there's an ad hoc system, it means that one can never be sure as a government regulator, one can never be sure how treaties are to be interpreted um, in the future. You cannot work out how to advise your colleagues in the Department for Environment or for Climate Change that are working on such legislation. And you cannot guarantee that uh, costs will be allocated in such a way that the loser really will pay. And the best example of that, the most recent example of that, unfortunately, is the Australia and the Philip Morris case that has ended up paying $27 million, having completely successfully defended the case. Um, and so all of that creates um, a tendency, as we see it, to, to settle. It creates a pressure on the right to regulate. And the question is, uh, how do we find our way um, out of that? And we think this is one of the virtues um, of the multilateral investment court because it creates predictability. And some of you have heard me use this analogy before. The comparator is a WTO. In the WTO in the 1980s, we had all the same types of concerns, very much the same types of things that, that, that Jane has just um, talked about. Did they change the rules? And, and those concerns have basically gone now. 
Did they change the rules? No, they didn't change the rules. What they did was they changed the dispute settlement system. And what did they change in the dispute settlement system, which of course is now under attack and which has to be defended, they changed the, the, the nature of it by introducing a permanent standing body that introduced predictability. And now the states in the WTO know what their exposure is when they're looking at legislation. They know how to draft legislation on climate change or on health or whatever the matter um, um, may be. So we think the multilateral investment course is extremely important from uh, this angle of ensuring that the right to regulate is um, protected. It has many other virtues. Um, it, um, in our view, deals with the concerns that have arisen around the appointment of arbitrators and the incentives that draw from that. Um, and we also think that it can be very effective in reducing costs and making disputes settlement more effective. But I'm not going to develop those other um, ideas uh, just now. The one that I think I would like to emphasize is this point on right to record. Thank you.